This episode is sponsored by Surfshark. The Big Bang Theory says that the universe was an incredibly hot and dense soup of primordial particles in its first second. Then from 3 to 20 minutes, the first nuclei of hydrogen and helium formed. Fast forward 400,000 years, and the universe was cold enough for the first atoms to appear. The first stars formed about 150 million years later, ending the Dark Ages. This first generation of stars was primarily composed of hydrogen and helium and lacked heavy elements. They formed the first proto-galaxies about 500 million years after the Big Bang. These were the clusters of gas that clung to vast, invisible dark matter structures. Finally, these proto-galaxies merged to form the very first large galaxies of the universe. Our star formation and galaxy evolution models predict what these primordial galaxies should look like. However, until now, we did not have the technology to observe these distant high redshift structures in the early universe. But the James Webb Space Telescope has been specifically designed to accomplish this task. Besides taking extraordinary pictures overflowing with details, the most important discovery made by the James Webb Space Telescope is of the so-called blue monsters in the early universe that has challenged our current cosmological models. But what exactly are these blue monsters? How do they question our current models of the beginning of the universe? Finally, and most importantly, how will this discovery change our understanding of the formation of stars and galaxies? There are four important things that you need to know about these galaxies observed by the James Webb Space Telescope. The first is that these galaxies have a redshift of more than 10. This means they are a population of super early galaxies that formed within the first billion years after the Big Bang. Second, they are relatively massive, having a stellar mass ranging from 0.1 billion to 5 billion solar masses. That's puzzling because if we consider our models, such huge, well-formed galaxies should not exist in the early universe. The third point is that they have a very small dust attenuation. And finally, their UV continuum slope is about negative 2.6. These last two terms might be new to you, so let me explain them in a simple way. Cosmic dust is something that has constantly annoyed scientists. So we went to the great extent of putting a telescope in space to make our observations better, only to find out that there are also problems at the other end. Cosmic dust is basically dust in space. These grains typically range in size from 5 to 250 nanometers, two orders of magnitude smaller than household dust particles, and comparable to combustion or smoke particles. Dust is formed in stars and then is blown off in a slow wind or a massive star explosion. It is then recycled in the clouds of gas between stars, and some of it is consumed when the next generation of stars begins to form. Astronomers used to consider dust a problem because it absorbs the visible light from objects, keeping them hidden from our optical telescopes, making the universe appear very dark and hiding many interesting things from us. But these dusty clouds have a silver lining. When astronomers started using infrared telescopes, they discovered that the annoying cosmic dust is very interesting and essential to many astronomical processes. The dust converts the stolen starlight it absorbs into light at longer wavelengths, which astronomers can study in the mid-infrared range of the EM spectrum. Although dust forms a tiny fraction of the galaxy's overall mass, its impact on the observations of galaxies is striking. So we have to consider dust attenuation to accurately determine the brightness of the galaxy, its stellar population, and the UV continuum slope. The UV continuum slope beta specifies how the flux density of a galaxy varies with the wavelength in the UV continuum. Simply put, 
It tells us how much radiation is being emitted at different wavelengths of the ultraviolet continuum, or the wavelength range between 130 nanometers to 350 nanometers. The lower the value of this slope, the bluer the galaxy. Here are the beta values of some of the galaxy candidates discovered by the James Webb Space Telescope. These values indicate that the galaxies are extremely blue, and since they are pretty massive, the researchers have named them blue monsters. A simple explanation would be that these early galaxies suffer very little obscuration, meaning their dust content must be very low, and that's why the blue and the UV wavelengths being emitted by the stars are reaching us without any hindrance. But one factor contradicts this relatively straightforward solution. It is the stellar mass that is incredibly high. Massive stars and supernovas are the main dust factories for cosmic ages of less than 1 billion years. Since giant stars are short-lived, the supernova rate in early galaxies is comparatively high, which means there should be a lot of dust in these early galaxies. That would imply that these galaxies should have a lower UV slope. The shorter wavelengths must be attenuated, and their colors should not be blue. The researchers even provided a simple calculation to illustrate the problem by plugging in the values of the known stellar mass, supernova rate, and a salpeter initial mass function. They concluded that these galaxies must be heavily obscured in contrast to the observations. So how do we resolve this apparent conflict? How can we explain the blue color of distant galaxies despite a huge dust content? Astronomers have proposed two possibilities to solve the mystery of Webb's blue monsters. The first is the dust ejection scenario. It states that the dust produced by the supernovas on very short timescales is ejected into the intergalactic medium at a rate exceeding its production rate, and the force expelling the galactic dust into the intergalactic medium comes from the strong radiation pressure exerted by the observed UV-emitting stars. This is an important figure from the research paper. It's a graph between the dust outflow rate and the disk star formation rate per unit area. When the curves are located in the dust clearing region, the dust ejection rate is faster than the production rate shown in red, and the galaxy is cleared. In the opposite case, or the white region, dust accumulates due to a slow ejection rate. The cyan points are almost dust-free galaxies discovered by Webb and lie in the dust-clearing area. The orange point marks a heavily obscured galaxy found by Webb at a redshift of 12.1, which lies closer to the dust accumulation region. This means the galaxy has a high star formation rate and is producing dust at a rate faster than it's ejecting. The alternative scenario to explain low dust attenuation is the spatial segregation of dust. In this scenario, the ultraviolet radiation mostly comes from the transparent diffuse interstellar medium, hosting either little or cold dust. The dust-obscured star-forming regions are instead located in giant molecular clouds that are strongly emitting at infrared wavelengths. Although both scenarios provide a physical explanation for the blue colors of the observed galaxies, they make different predictions concerning some infrared fluxes at particular wavelengths, which can be tested by the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, or ALMA. Regarding the segregation scenario, the paper is mostly against it because of some former observations from earlier this year using ALMA. In the end, with the observations done with ALMA, the segregation theory could not really work, but instead, the dust ejection scenario is possible. This could be a good explanation for the unexpected brightness of these ancient galaxies. Further exploration of this idea will give us a better insight into the formation of these galaxies, how they work, and eventually, the beginning of our universe. After all the radio signals that we've sent in space, there may not be a way to hide our location in the universe, but there's a way you can protect your privacy in the vast web of the internet. It's time to talk about the sponsors of this video, Surfshark VPN. Surfshark is an app and a web browser extension that helps you access any website that's been blocked in your region. It helps you virtually place your device anywhere in the world 
so that you can access the internet as if you were actually in that country. This way, you can stream your favorite movies and shows you generally cannot access from your region. Another benefit of using Surfshark is anonymity. It keeps you safe and private by covering up everything you do online. When your device connects to the internet, all that information is encrypted, so anyone who tries to snoop on you won't be able to see what you're doing or where you're doing it from. In addition, Surfshark is the only VPN that lets you use multiple devices on one account. You can access our promo code SOU and get 83% off and three extra months of free access to Surfshark. So check out the link in the description and make the most of this deal. Surfshark also offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there is no risk to try it out.